Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Emergency Response and Private Wells Colloquium. We are so excited to have you here again today. If you missed the first session on Tuesday, it was recorded, and we'll have those recordings up on our website hopefully sometime next week. This session will be recorded as well, and those will be two separate videos. First thing I want to do is just introduce ourselves again. We won't go through the full intro that we did on Tuesday, but my name is Jennifer Wilson. I'll be your moderator today. We also have Katie Buckley, my colleague here at the Illinois State Water Survey, uh, running the Q&A in the background. So if you set, submit questions or, or have trouble, she's your gal. And then we also have our program manager, Steve Wilson. He is there in the background, but he will be muted today because he's a little bit under the weather. But um, he's the one who often does our webinars and really runs the show around here. Our funding comes through RCAP, the Rural Community Assistance Partnership, from the US EPA. We're entirely grant funded, so everything we do is free to help educate the public and professionals like yourselves about private well issues. One thing I wanted to especially highlight is our upcoming Private Well Conference. This is our second conference. The first one was two years ago. This one will take place May 21st to 23rd in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. I personally scouted at the site, and I think it's going to be really great. It's a very cute, fun downtown area with lots of restaurants, and it's going to be a wonderful agenda. We are aiming to have that released tomorrow, Monday, at the very, very latest. We're doing – we're – I think you all are really going to love the sessions we have this time. We've tried to make it quite different than our last conference. And if you were here on Tuesday, you heard some really wonderful testimonials from our speakers about how important this conference was for even some of the work that they talked about, developing these relationships with other professionals so that they, we can all do our jobs just a little bit better. And you can find out more about the conference at privatewellclass.org slash conference. And as I said, everything we do is free, so you just need to get yourself there. If you have a question today, pop it in the question box. We will be having two different types of questions. Uh, question sessions. We'll be able to answer two to three questions at the end of every presentation, and then we'll have a longer 35-minute panel discussion at the end. And if you could indicate whether or not your question is for that specific speaker or you're interested in responses from the whole panel, that will help us organize those questions a little bit better. And if you're in need of continuing education credit for attending, we are pre-approved for NEHA CE credit as well as Illinois LEHP credit. You just need to send an email to info at privatewellclass.org to get your certificate. And if you are needing that NEHA credit, there's a form you need to fill out and submit to that email address, and it's in the handout section of the webinar. You can also find a copy of the agenda there as well. So as I said, the day one presentations were recorded. You can see those here. We will have those on the website next week. We really had a great discussion, and I hope to continue that today, sharing these experiences and so many really great actionable tactics that um, were presented, and I know we're going to have even more today. So today's presentations include Groundwater Well Protection and Recovery from Wildland Fire by John Hamner. He's with the Rural Community Assistance Corporation. We have Allison Snyder talking about the impact of disaster events on private water systems. She's with NEHA. And then finally, we have Aubrey Gilliland from LSU speaking on opportunities to increase well user resilience after a natural disaster. We'll have lots of additional case studies today, but even more of that kind of wrap-up comprehensive discussion of what we all can be doing a little bit better to improve our efficiency and effectiveness with surveying well owners during and after these disasters. And with this, I will change it to our first pre presenter, which is John. And while this is opening, my name is John Hamner. I am the general manager for the Calliope County Water District, but I'm also a part-time employee for the uh, Rural Community Assistance Cor uh, Corporation. I've been a I uh, was a full-time employee for them for 11 years, and I've been a part-time employee for about five and a half years since I took over this system. And let's turn this on, get this going. And the first thing I'd like to do is tell you what I'm going to tell you. And I'm hoping that everybody can see everything okay. If not, I'm sure that uh, one of the moderators will interrupt me. Uh, if you live in an area where there's wildland fire possibility, um, it's been my experience that your focus should be on two things, either prevention of loss to fire 
or unfortunately, occasionally it's going to be a recovery from a loss to fire. Uh, here in Middletown, which is in Southern Lake County, Northern California, uh, we experienced something called the Valley Fire in 2015. I'm going to elaborate on that a little bit. And uh, during that fire, we had some loss here. I lost my uh, office building and my uh, water treatment plant. And I have some customers that had private wells, so I'm familiar with some of the losses that they experienced. And the biggest thing that I learned from all of it was that you need to do some things to prevent a loss to fire, uh, but there's also some things that you want to keep in mind in case you experience a loss from fire. Uh, real quick on the Valley Fire itself, uh, the fire started on September 12th at about 1.24 in the afternoon in the community of Cobb. Initially, it was about two acres in size, but within 30 minutes, it had grown to about 50 acres. Uh, this was a fire that was started by some faulty wiring at a hot tub. At this home was at the top of a hill, and directly downhill was a valley between two little hillsides, and the wind was perfect. It just blew it right through there like a blowtorch, and it just took off. And the wind that day was incredible. It was just blowing different directions, and it was very high rate of, of speed. And uh, by 2 o'clock, the community of Cobb was evacuated, which was approximately 2,000 people in, in less than a half an hour. It, it, if you haven't seen something like this before or experienced it, you're not going to believe how fast it happens. In about two and a half hours, the fire had reached uh, Harbin Hot Springs, which was about seven miles. Uh, again, two and a half hours, seven miles. It, it was incredible. And by 5.15, about uh, three hours after the fire started, uh, they started recommending that people evacuate Middletown, which is the community that I'm the manager for the water system here. And this was eight miles away. And I, I have to tell you that when the fire started, we never in a million years expected the fire to get this far, this fast. Uh, many of us were in denial. Um, I can tell you that 7.30 that night, uh, they had about 10,000 acres had been burned. And by 1.25 a.m. on the 13th, uh, they had about 40,000 acres. And coincidentally, at about 1.25 a.m. was whenever my water storage tank started going dry. And uh, <laughs> firefighting in the town of Middletown stopped at that point because there was no water. Uh, the fire stretched into other counties of Sonoma and Napa. And at that time, I believe it was about the third most damaging fire in California. Uh, in the end, uh, four, four civilians, uh, four firefighters were severely injured. Uh, one of them is unable to return back to work. We had about 2,000 structures that were destroyed, including 1,200 homes, 27 multifamily structures, and uh, 66 commercial properties. And it was, it was pretty devastating. When I first heard about it, it was about 1.45, so it was about 10, 15 minutes after the fire had started. And I kind of monitored it throughout the day, even though it was up at Cobb. I knew there was no way that it could get to us or to get to the town of Middletown because of the distance. I knew that it was about eight miles from uh, Middletown, and I also knew that it was probably about 20 miles from my house. At about five o'clock, my wife and I took the dogs out for a walk, and this is what I envisioned. And this 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 picture doesn't really even grasp how frightening it was uh, to look at the sky. That this was incredibly ominous. All of that was smoke, and by this time, we're talking about seven miles worth of fire, uh, because at this time it was just just approaching the town of Middletown. Uh, although I was in awe, I'll be honest, I was still in denial until my secretary sent me this picture at about 5.30 with no caption to it, and I responded to the text. I said, what is this? And she says, don't you recognize the house? And that's when I realized that that house in the picture is my board president's house in the town of Middletown, and that that fire was directly behind Middletown, and the wind was blowing this direction. And that was whenever I was no longer in denial because I realized that the fire was, in fact, uh, going to be consuming parts of Middletown. Uh, I had a very sleepless night. I was not able to get to the town itself because the roads were blocked. And frankly, most of the people were trying to get out of Middletown, not trying to get in. Uh, we did follow social media. And this is one thing I would like to stress for those of you that ever go through an ex uh, emergency of any kind. Uh, social media can be wonderful, but it can also be very frustrating, and people will post things on there that they heard. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's true. And I can tell you that while we were watching this, we heard many things that after the fact were in fact not true. Um, 
entire communities burnt to the ground, which proved not to be the case, uh, gas stations that were burnt to the ground, etc. cetera. Uh, just be real careful with social media, and I really invite you that if you're a fan of social media, that if you post something, uh, make sure you've got it from a good source before you put it out there. The next morning, I was trying to get out of, out of, uh, out of my driveway by 6 o'clock in the morning with my coffee, and all of a sudden, I heard a bullhorn, and it turned out that our community was being evacuated, even though we were 20 miles away. Uh, they were telling us that the fire is coming, the fire is coming. And so I had to go wake up my wife and gather the dogs and get into our vehicles what we could in a short amount of time. And this was one of the first times that I discovered that if you're not prepared for a fire, these are the types of things that you need to be thinking about. If there is an emergency, what is it you're going to grab? I can tell you that I have lists on my desk, in my computer, I even have a short list in my wallet because whenever an emergency is actually there, you might forget. You might forget that the most important thing to you, in my case, is my laptop uh, and important documents. Those are my first two things. Um, you might think pictures is high on your list and maybe it is on your list, but I discovered the pictures is further down on my list. Uh, my wife and I have multiple lists now. Uh, based on the fact that since the Valley Fire, we've had major fires in Lake County every summer for the last three years. Um, last summer was what they call the Mendocino Complex Fire, which was actually two fires that combined. And when it, by the time it was done, they said it was the largest fire that California had ever experienced, and it lasted for several weeks. Once we got landed at my father's house in the town of Lakeport, I made my first attempt to get to Middletown mid-morning. I was turned away at roadblocks. When there's emergencies like this, um, the, the highway patrol or law enforcement is going to start blocking the highways, and there's a very good possibility you're not going to get through. So if you've left there, don't plan on going back soon, and if you're trying to get into there after the emergency has happened, you, you need to know that you're probably not going to be able to get through unless you are law enforcement or some sort of emergency provider. I made another attempt at around 1 o'clock, and they finally let me through with escort, and I got into Middletown at about 2 o'clock. Uh, on the ride over, I saw many things like this. Uh, people abandoned their vehicles. I saw vehicles that were wrecked and abandoned. Uh, hundreds of telephone poles burnt to the ground with wires hanging in the road. Um, dead animals. I saw all kinds of horrific stuff on my drive over. As I came into town, I took a quick snapshot to the left. This is the entrance into town. And over here, where you see a blank spot, that's where my secretary's house used to be. Uh, the community of Middletown itself, uh, I lost 110 customers. Uh, two of them were businesses. The rest of them were homes. And that's just in my community, the, waters, the water folks that I serve. Um, it was pretty devastating. Once I got to my treatment plant, this is what I found. Uh, my office building was gone. Uh, so was my treatment plant. It was burnt up pretty good. Um, real quick sidebar here. You can see my medicine ca or my medicine cabinet, my filing cabinet over here. This was in my office. My backup to my computer was sitting right here on top of the computer itself. Uh, I lost all of my documents, all the documents that I had five years worth in my computer. Uh, lesson learned, folks. If, if you're going to have backup, I recommend that you have computer backup on the cloud or have uh, some units sitting on your desk that you can swap out. Maybe have a safety deposit box or someplace safe that you can so that you've got different places to store your documents. Uh, I can tell you that right now here at the uh, Water District office, we do have a safety deposit box and we swap them out once in a while and we also store them on the cloud. Uh, but back to the presentation, uh, my office, that's, that's what you're looking at here is my office, uh, was destroyed. And the other thing, another quick sidebar, all of the keys to our vehicles, to our two vehicles, were inside of the building. Uh, and they were lost. And it turned out that the two vehicles were also parked in front of our generator. Uh, we could not get access to our generator, so we had to hook up to our vehicles with chains and literally pull them out of the way without the tires rolling. Uh, so you want to make sure that you have keys, spare keys to your vehicles in other locations, if at all possible. Our generator, although a little bit scorched, and you can't see it, but it's off to the right of this picture, uh, it was in good shape even though it was scorched. Uh, my water storage tanks were in good shape, and today we're talking about groundwater wells, and this is one thing that I feel felt kind of lucky about, is our groundwater well was in good shape. Uh, my operator does a really good job of keeping all of the weeds and foliage away from the wellhead. 
Uh, we do have a wellhead building. Uh, there was no scorch at all. Um, within you know, 50 to 100 feet of it, you could see some ground scorch from the weeds. Uh, but as far as the well itself, no problems. Uh, my big problem in here was the filters. I, I lost my filters. Uh, this, this is what you're looking at in the background here. We had two uh, filtration units, and all of this piping used to be inside of the building, which burnt down. And the water was still flowing through this piping and going through the filters once we got the system up and running again. Uh, but I can tell you that every joint on these piping was leaking quite severely. Um, but as I said, 1 o'clock, 1.30 in the morning, our tanks went completely dry. I was here at 2 o'clock the next day, and we started filling up the tanks, and by 10 a.m. the next morning, we had enough water in the tanks to pressurize the town again. Uh, so I was lucky. I can tell you the neighboring water system in the town of uh, Lower Lake, uh, they weren't so lucky. They were about two weeks without water. Uh, a lot of their uh, consumers refused to evacuate when the order came because here in California, you don't have to evacuate if you don't want to as long as there's an understanding that they will not come and save you if, 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 if they don't have to. Uh, so, but if you do evacuate, you're not getting back in until you're told that you can, and I'll talk more about that in a few moments. So... Based upon my experiences through that, and that was a very quick version, uh, I've only got limited time today. Uh, if you live in an area where wildland, wildland is a fire is a possibility, your focus should be on prevention of loss or the recovery of loss. So what I'm gonna talk about for the next, uh, what have I got, 15 minutes or so, I'm, I'm gonna talk about the things that I learned from this and a few tips, and hopefully you'll get something out of this today. As far as planning for fires in case they come, if you're a, uh, a public water system like we are, we have mutual aid in place now. Uh, we have started something here in the county uh, with all of the water districts. We meet, uh, we used to meet monthly, now we meet quarterly, and we have an uh, emergency response plan template that we're all using. We have different areas. We've got three different areas with a liaison and a backup liaison for each one. Now, this may not apply to private well owners, but you may want to consider neighborhood meetings to discuss fire planning. And maybe you have neighborhoods that are close together. Maybe your nearest neighbor is a mile away. You still may want to talk to these folks. Uh, hopefully, you get along with your neighbors. But uh, in any event, hopefully, you'd want to talk to them and talk about some planning in case a fire did come and what you may do and find out what resources they have and what resources you have that you could share with them in case they are the ones that are experiencing loss to fire. In many areas, uh, there are county and occasionally state agencies that are proactive and maybe have something in place that can assist you. And another big one that I, I also recommend is, is doing an assessment of your system. Uh, see how prone, how likely you are to experience loss from fire based upon the fuel that's in your area. Uh, are there trees close to the power lines that come into your, your uh, property if you have overhead electrical lines? And in some cases, electrical is underground. Uh, I can tell you from experience uh, after the fire that if there's a fire above ground, it can still melt stuff that is three, four, even five feet underground. A uh, neighboring water system lost a number of PVC, plastic, uh, water mains. And uh, FEMA was wanting to argue with them, saying, no, that stuff's underground. It's not going to melt. And it had to be proven to uh, FEMA representatives that, yes, PVC plastic can melt if it's three to five feet underground if the fire is hot enough above ground. So, again, these are things you want to be thinking about. Is it overhead? Is it underground? And this is one of the biggest things that I'm going to really have you guys assess or hope that you assess is what is your electrical light coming onto the property? Because if you lose electricity, uh, you need to plan for it. And then we're talking generators, and I'll elaborate more on that in a moment. Uh, here's my email address, which is not in the original presentation that I sent to folks. But uh, if you want to write it down, I can send you a copy of an assessment form. I'm going to show you the first page in just a moment. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about insurance, because uh, we, we had a pretty uh, nasty experience with our insurance here. Uh, so this is an example of an assessment, and this assessment, once I start looking at it, 
it looks to me almost like more like something that you would actually put in front of you in case there's a fire that has just broken out and maybe you're having trouble thinking. So it's kind of a checklist, kind of a checklist, if you will. So you might want to go down and say, what, what is the size of the involved area? Uh, do I need to be concerned? Which way is the wind blowing? Uh, what do I have at my disposal to help fight fire if I need to? Uh, so th there's lots of examples out there of doing an assessment both before the fire, during the fire, and after. This one is more for during. Uh, covers fire and earthquake, of course, which is a concern of ours out here in California. Uh, but if anybody wants this, I'll back up one. My email address, once again, jhamner at rcac.org. As far as insurance, this was something that I didn't really know until we actually went through this. The previous general manager of this public water system was looking for a better deal on insurance, and he sat down with uh, an insurance agent in his office, and the insurance agent asked questions like, so how much do you think this building is worth? Oh, I don't know, 170000 That's what they put. And it, long story short, it turned out that we were drastically underinsured. Uh, whenever it was all said and done, we got about $395,000, and replacement for what we've lost is about $2.4 million. Um, I, I really recommend that you check your insurance policies. Uh, you may want to go check as well to see if you have fire replacement or if you just got loss. And, and there is a difference. Uh, but again, you may want to look at your insurance policy, talk to your agent. Uh, I can also tell you that if you are in an area that is likely uh, to experience wildland fire, uh, my wife and I were trying to look into less expensive insurance for fire for our property. Uh, we called our insurance agent and we were told you should not try to get, no, nobody would cover us. And so the insurance company that we have, we have a very high deductible. They were still covering us, but other people that were trying to get insurance through them would not cover fire in the area that we live. It just so happens that we live at the base of a dormant volcano that is covered in thousands of acres of scrub brush that is very dry from five years of drought. And uh, it's a high fire area, and no insurance companies want to cover it because we've had major fires in Lake County for the last five years. Uh, also, whenever it comes to insurance, this was something that I discovered uh, whenever I was kind of doing a little bit of research for this presentation. One of the other water managers in uh, the county here was telling me that they knew somebody that was trying to claim something was lost in a fire that wasn't actually lost. The insurance company was able to prove it, and they invalidated the entire claim. Uh, so if you do have loss, uh, make sure that you list what you've lost only. Uh, whenever it comes to loss, it's a really good idea to take pictures and or videos of your home, your belongings, and also of your well, uh, your wellhead, uh, any pressure tanks that you have, any electrical, everything that's going to it so that you actually have some sort of proof. And some documentation with it would help as well. Uh, especially if you've got receipts, but even if you don't, get some pictures of it. I can tell you that my wife and I both have in three different locations uh, pictures and videos of everything that we have inside our home and outside of our home uh, so that we can hope to get replacement. Uh, whenever I was trying to get uh, an insurance claim through my insurance company, clearly they were out for their interest, which I understand, and we ended up hiring an adjuster that would assist us and there were so many things in the fire that we lost that we had forgot about and his recommendation was to go down to the hardware store with a notepad and a, and a pen and walk up and oh yeah I forgot I had a can of insecticide there's five bucks or whatever it may be uh, so there's ways around it but I really recommend that just to prepare for it that you go out and take some pictures so as far as wells themselves, um, hopefully none of us have a well like this where we're still pulling the bucket up to get some drinking water. Uh, the two primary types of wells are going to be turbine and submersible wells. Uh, turbines are usually your larger applications. Um, it's going to be for higher flows, uh, 200 to 2,000 gallons per minute. You've got your electrical motor above ground. You can see that on the right where it says motor. Uh, 
Uh, they've got a line shaft that operates the pumps down below. And the number of bowls is dependent upon your water needs. Uh, the big thing that you need to be concerned with this, though, is what is above ground? Because we're talking about the fire is above this line right here. So if we have a turbine motor, we need to be concerned about, clearly, the motor and everything, and, and also if there's a building around this. But based on my experience, one of your biggest concerns should be electrical. Uh, is your electrical overhead? Is it underground? Where does it come in? Is it protected? Is there fuel? And by fuel, I mean trees, dry brush, grasses, anything like that, that could take out that telephone pole, that could melt the wires that are underground. Uh, and again, the rest of this is things that you want to be worried about. If, if there's a building around this, I'm going to talk about uh, prevention in a few moments. There's ways that you can protect the building. If you don't have a building around it, there's also ways that you can protect this equipment uh, with tarps, fire-resistant fire tarps and things like that. I'll elaborate in a few moments. But you need to keep in mind that everything that's above ground is going to be potentially damaged. But also, there's casing that goes underground. And I've seen casing that's made of plastic, PVC, thin metal, and then thicker metal. Well, of course, the thickest metal is, is going to be least likely to be damaged underground. But if you've got plastic casing, there's a very good chance that you're going to have some damage that goes underground as well. In my district, I had, uh, I had about 50 homes. I apologize. I thought my phone was turned off. And of those 50 homes that have their own personal wells, I would say about 20 of them lost their wells. And most of them chose to abandon them rather than rebuild because they are still on a public water system. And based on some of the experience I had with them, it's, it's kind of tragic because you can't just walk away from it. You have to fill this up with gravel and with concrete, and you have to get permission and permits and spend money through the county in order to abandon a well properly. Uh, submersible wells, uh, usually smaller applications, uh, capable of five to 2,000 gallons per minute. The electric motor and the bowls are all down below the ground. So there's less chance that they're going to get damaged. Uh, but you do need to worry about what's up top. And what's up top varies from system to system. Uh, so the, the picture that I just showed you, all of that is way down below the ground right here. And this is all that's going to be sticking above the ground. Uh, this is a representation of what could be sticking above the ground. And then the water is going to flow out through this piece of pipe right here, and it might go into some sort of pressure, pressure tank that's going to provide the pressure to your house to make sure that you're getting 60 PSI or something in that area. And then you can see you've got electrical here, and you've got some gauges and some faucets and some plastic pipe. And all of this is exposed to the elements. In this particular case, they don't have a pump house over it. So as an example, I'll talk more about this in a moment. If I'm looking, if I'm trying to get out of Dodge because the fire is coming or I just want to protect this if I'm staying and fighting it, in this case, since there is no building, what I would be looking at is, is a tarp. And you're going to find the tar tarps are a little bit pricey. that I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, but this is something that you can do to help prevent fire if it is coming in your direction. As far as the electrical, if it's underground, make sure that you got all the fuel above ground cleared away. That's your uh, grasses, your trees, your bushes, etc. If it's overhead and you have poles, uh, consider spraying with fire retardant. Uh, I'm going to talk about fire retardant in just a moment. I can tell you that uh, last summer, whenever we had uh, the two fires that merged into one here in Lake County, and I drove through after the fact, I could tell that PG&E had come through and sprayed all of the poles with, uh, with fire retardant because they were all red in color. So I'm sure that you've all seen the airplanes flying overhead over the fires, dropping all this retardant. It happens to be red in color. Uh, and PG&E had come through and sprayed all of their poles, hoping, I'm sorry, Pacific Gas and Electric, PG&E, our electric company out here, uh, trying to keep their, their poles from burning during the fire. If you're thinking about getting a generator, you want to make sure that you have it sized and have it professionally installed. This is not something that you can go down and purchase and just plug it in. Uh, the water manager for a neighboring water system that went through the Clayton fire uh, two years ago, uh, unfortunately, he did that. He, he was brought in, borrowed a generator, tried to wire it directly to his pump, and he burnt it up. And be honest, he did it a second time as well uh, before he got a professional in there to, to size the generator for his equipment and purchase the third new pump. Uh, 
have it professionally done, is what I'm trying to say. Uh, and then finally, you may want to spray your building with fire retardant. Um, and again, Fozcheck was the product that I use. I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, the well building, as far as the pump house, keep all of your fuel away from it. If you've got gutters on the building, most people don't. It's just a pump house. But if you do have gutters, make sure they're cleaned. If you research what starts a fire, one of the biggest uh, things that start fires is going to be your leaves and debris that has built up in gutters. You may also want to consider metal roofs and uh, some fireproof siding such as metal and we have something out here in California I'm not sure if you guys have it it's called Hardy Backer uh, and then finally you may want to consider spray spraying your building with fire retardant the stuff that I used on my home and this is something that uh, last year was the first year that we used it uh, was called Fozcheck it's the same stuff that they spray from the airplanes that you see that looks kind of a reddish color whenever you see videos on the news of firefighters fighting fire from the, from the sky. The stuff that we got was clear, uh, so it doesn't have the red color. I got uh, five gallon containers for about $210 a piece, and I purchased their sprayer, which I don't recommend, and I'll talk about that in a moment. And the product itself says it's primarily for plant life, so it's to spray your bushes and trees and grasses around your property. But I can tell you that whenever I talked to the salesman, he said that anything that's wood would also be protected. So we sprayed our six-foot wooden fence that we have around our property. We sprayed our deck. I also sprayed the under the eaves of my house, but as far as the siding, it, it's, it's, it's fire resistant. It's not fireproof, the siding on our house. But again, I, I sprayed everything that I could. Uh, we did have a large stack of wood, and uh, rather than spray it, we were looking at tarps, um, but then ultimately my, decide, my wife decided that we no longer burn firewood, uh, so we ended up getting rid of it last summer. Um, other things that you can do, is there's fire retardant paint, and the important thing to remember whenever you look into this is you've got either heat resistant or fire retardant. Uh, heat resistant is going to burn very slow, but it will still burn. Fire retardant is going to keep it from burning. Uh, your difference is from 62 a gallon to uh, whatever 686 is. It's a little bit more than 62. I think it's about twice the price, actually, uh, per gallon to get something that's fire retardant. Uh, whenever I got the FOS check, I went ahead and I ordered their sprayer. It did not work and uh, they did not want to uh, reimburse us. They just wanted to replace it. We ended up using uh, handheld sprayers, and it didn't work very well because the product is so thick. As far as tarps, uh, here's the website that I Googled. And again, keep in mind, whenever you look at these, they've got fire resistant, and then they've got uh, uh, fire retardant. So one just will not catch fire. Uh, you can see that they get kind of pricey, about $600. If you get one that's about 20 by 30 uh, but again, they've got everything from very thin ones that will help to ones that will just will not burn. So if you've got like a submersible pump set up, like the one that I showed you a few moments ago, you got a big enough tarp and you hear there's a fire coming, throw it over your equipment and get out of there, unless you choose to stay and fight. Um, I'm very brave about a lot of things, but firefighting is not one of them. So let's say that you've lost everything. Now we're going to talk about fire recovery mode. Uh, fire recovery, the first thing, I, I would almost assume that if you've lost your well, you've lost more than just your well. Uh, chances are you may have lost your home or some outbuildings or other things that were important to you. So you need to ask yourself, how important is water to the property that's been destroyed? So you want to evaluate that to see if you want to get your well back online, and if so, how long will it take? Uh, you also want to ask yourself, is water safety itself an issue? Um, whenever there's fires, there's lots of things that can get, get down into water tables that may cause potential health issues for humans. So you may want to look, in that, look into that. Uh, and then, is water needed for sanitary reasons? By sanitary, I'm referring primarily to flushing toilets. Um, something I'm going to elaborate on in a moment. It, when, when everything's gone, including the trees, uh, restrooms become an issue, especially whenever you're a little bit older like myself. Uh, keep in mind there's going to be evacuation of communities and there's going to be roadblocks. The roadblocks are going to be usually from law enforcement and a lot of times the law enforcement is not from your area. So you might pull up and say, hey, I'm Joe Blow. I live down there. I just want to go get my horses out. I don't know you. I don't live here. I've heard it. I've heard this before. 
uh, I'm driving a truck that says Calliope County Water District on it, and the Highway Patrol would not let me through. Um, if you leave, uh, they may not let you return until all parties agree, and by all parties I mean, uh, in our case, Caltrans, people responsible for highways, uh, PG&E, the people responsible for the electrical lines. Uh, everybody has to agree, including the fire department, that it's safe to come back in. If they don't, they're not going to let you back in through the evacuation roadblocks. Uh, make sure you have ID with addresses. Uh, uh, and our little emergency plan that we have around here, we all have name badges now that shows that we are actually, and, and the, the local county uh, office of emergency services has seen them and approved them and will recognize them so that we can pull up and say, yes, I'm with the water district. I need to get into town to make sure that, that the people that are there still have safe drinking water. Uh, it's a good idea to know somebody. Uh, I know the sheriff here in the county personally, uh, and if you don't know somebody, keep asking until you find somebody that does know somebody. As they say, it's, it's sometimes it's all about who you know. Uh, if you are caught in an evacu er, evacuated area, be, be able to explain yourself why you're there or else you're going to risk arrest. Uh, electrical, again, this, this, this is one of the most crucial components that you need to be thinking about, in my opinion, when it comes to your well. If there's no electricity, you're not pumping water. If there's no electricity, you're not pumping water. So you've got to ask yourself, how bad is it? Uh, will the electrical utility be up in a reasonable amount of time, or is there any way to find out? If there isn't, then what is your responsibility? Are you serving just yourself, or are you serving a group of neighbors? Uh, do you have to install the poles and lines at your expense, or is this something an electrical company is going to do for you? Something you may want to know ahead of time. Do you need a generator? If you do, you can go down to out here. We have Costco which is a box store. Uh, I thought about purchasing one for our house and found out that it almost cost more to have a uh, qualified electrician come out and wire it in for me than it did for the actual generator. Uh, they may be a little bit hard to find after a major fire. I know that for our public water system, we have one that we can pull right out there. Actually, we've left it parked there now. We can just plug it right in, throw a few switches, and we've got the electrical going again. Uh, it may also be hard to find an electrician after a major fire. Uh, generators for most pump and well applications will not be a simple plug and play. Uh, they need to be done by a professional. It should be part of your prevention plan uh, that we talked about earlier. Uh, whether it's a written plan or something you've at least thought out and maybe discussed with uh, the people that are living in your home or your neighbors at a neighborhood watch group. And sorry about that if my email just popped up. I'm um, trying to speed this up. I think we're getting close to the end here. Uh, if you've lost your pump motor, is this something you can do yourself? If not, you may want to have a list in your emergency plan of electricians that may be able to come help you, keeping in mind that the electrician, if he's local, he or she is local, they may have lost their equipment as well. Uh, do you need to call a pump person or a well person? Uh, also, replacement uh, should also be part of your prevention plan. Can you please stop? Uh, pump and motor specs, uh, manufacturers, name and phone number for the nearest provider, if at all possible. Again, it's a good idea to have that material there in case you need it, in case you've lost everything. Uh, as far as fire recovery in the building, if there is one, be careful. Once they've burnt, it's real easy for stuff to fall over. I saw a few people get hurt trying to go into buildings that have been burnt. Uh, you're going to need to do a cement pad assessment. Uh, there's something I think it's called checking, that if it's checked, then the, uh, the people that do the inspections, whether it's county or state, they may not approve it and tell you they have to replace the whole thing. Uh, I think our cement pad would have been fine for our building, but we were told by the government we couldn't reuse it. Uh, the sanitary seal is the uh, grout. It's going to be between the concrete up on top and the casing that's along, that uh, you pump the water out of. Uh, if it's been damaged, you may need to replace it, which is going to get kind of expensive. And again, electrical wire for submersible, or if you've got well casing, whether it's metal or plastic, it might be damaged a couple of feet down. You might be looking at a complete replacement for a new well. You're going to have to bring in a professional so they can give you a cost estimate of what it's going to cost to either repair or replace your well. And again, insurance, I talked about this briefly early. It should be part of your prevention plan. Make sure you have enough coverage. My advice is to re review this as soon as possible. See if, I mean, ask your agent directly, if I lost my well, are you going to cover it? Uh, most homeowners just have general loss only. 
That's been my experience. Uh, also, FEMA, if you're thinking about relying on FEMA, uh, they're not going to help you unless the state declares a state of emergency. I will say that's California. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's the same for all states, but your state has to declare a state of emergency before FEMA will come in and help you. Uh, FEMA, they, they say they're the Federal Emergency Management Agency. I say they're fix everything. My, well, you get the idea. Uh, we initially had somebody come in from FEMA and tell us we were going to get brand new everything. This was three and a half years ago. They did not. Um, in, in short version is I've got a water treatment plant that's about 90% built and they haven't even started on the building yet. It's very time consuming. But again, unless there is a state of emergency that's been declared, uh, FEMA is not going to step in. Uh, don't apply for FEMA until the state of emergency has been has been uh, called, because if you do, you're going to have to start the process all over again. It's a different batch of paperwork, and and how this word is going to vary state to state. But I'm telling you, there was a water system here in Lake County that applied for FEMA before the state of emergency was, was called, and they had to go back and redo their paperwork all over again. Uh, here in California, because we're so large, in order to get funding through FEMA, we actually go through Cal OES, which is the Office of Emergency Services. They're the one that does the paperwork, and they've got the purse strings. And it all starts with paperwork. And that's just going to simple name and address, what is it that you lost, and then it just grows from there. If there is an emergency like this, there's going to be a command center somewhere, and that's going to be everybody that you need to talk to. Uh, all agencies that can provide assistance will be there, and they're the ones that are going to have the paperwork and tell you to, to start filling things out and who to talk to. And try to be patient. It's going to be challenging, uh, but try to be patient because there's a lot of frustration involved. So some lessons that I learned were on the tail end here, folks, uh, that would apply to private owners. Uh, have an emergency plan of some sort, whether it's written or something in your head, neighborhood watch group. Uh, have some discussions, uh, hopefully based upon the things that I've told you today. Uh, you can have some discussions with somebody and be a little bit better prepared. Uh, look at your insurance policy. Uh, if it wasn't for FEMA, we would be in a buttload of trouble here because, as I said, we got $397,000 for $2.5 in losses. Uh, reach out to your neighbors before the disaster strikes. Uh, talk to friends and family in neighboring towns to see if you can stay at their house if necessary. Um, whenever my wife and I showed up at my father's house at uh, 7 o'clock in the morning, he was none too happy. Um, of course, this last summer he had to come stay at my house and he had a little bit more sympathy. Uh, stayed with us for three days because he got evacuated because the town of Lakeport uh, was under an, a mandatory evacuation because they were concerned about it burning. Have critical records. Again, mine was sitting on top of my computer. You don't, you don't want to do that. You don't want to do that. Generators, think ahead. This is one of the biggest things that you should be planning ahead for is generators, especially depending upon the electrical that's coming to your property. Good idea to have emergency food, food um, maybe some military meals, something like that. Uh, cases of water, fuel. Uh, one of the big problems for our generator was getting uh, um, diesel in and out of town for our generator. Uh, fortunately, we, once everything happened, we were able to rely on the tribe here and PG&E for uh, diesel to keep our generator going. Restroom, if you're old and have a small bladder like myself, it's a good idea because if all the trees are burnt, you can't go hide behind a tree. Uh, we ended up having some porta potties brought in. And again, extra keys because I lost mine in the fire. Um, stored at your neighbor's house, uh, your father's house in the neighboring town, whatever it may be. So things that I learned is prepare as best you can. Uh, you can only prepare so much for something like this, but still prepare as best you can, which involves a little bit of planning and planning, 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 more planning. Again, my name is John Hamner. Here's my email address. If you're interested in that evaluation, please send it my way. I don't know how I did on time. I hope I didn't go too far over. Thank you very much for your time. Have a great day. Thank you, John. This was excellent, especially in terms of some of the additional things that you share in relationship to FEMA and insurance. These are applicable uh, independent of the type of disaster that you're facing. Um, and I, I know that we're quite a few number of our attendees who do, do deal with public drinking water sector as well. So hopefully it was additionally useful for that uh, from that perspective.
Um, we have one question so far, but if you want to ask some additional questions for John, please do be submitting those right now in your question box. Uh, the first question we have is, were your residents required to boil their water once you were up and running? Yes, our storage tank went completely dry uh, because they were, they were fighting the fires as best they could, the fire department that was here. And it went dry about 1 o'clock in the morning. And that's a requirement that if your tank goes dry, you have to do a boil water notice once you're pressurized again. Uh, it was about a week and a day before the town was uh, repopulated. They call it repop. And the day before they got here is whenever I actually went around and hung, hung the door hangers for people to boil their water until it could be tested again. So short answer is yes, we did have to issue boil water notices. Okay. Let's see. Okay, any other questions right now? Nope. Okay. Well, if you do have additional questions for John, you can continue submitting those, and we will circle back um, during the panel time. But for now, we will transfer the presentation over to Allison. All right. So thank you, Jennifer. Um, I'll just quickly introduce myself. Uh, so my name is Allison Schneider. I'm a public health associate from the CDC working with the National Environmental Health Association for two years. And today I'm going to be talking about the impact of disaster events on private water systems. And while more broadly private water systems refers to just kind of any non-public system, uh, for the purposes of today's presentation, I'll be specifically talking about private wells and septic systems serving a single family home when I mention private water systems. So here's a quick agenda for the presentation today uh, to get us started. Uh, I'll first go over the importance of private water system preparedness or why does it matter. Um, I'll then talk about what the problem looks like, including kind of a big picture look at the impact of disaster events on private water systems over the past few years. And finally, I'll briefly outline a project NEHA is working on and some of the lessons we've learned um, while trying to help support agencies and organizations serving private well users. So to start off, why does it matter? So as we all know, uh, public health is really fragile after a disaster. In the general population, disaster events can impact public health in several ways, including an increase in severe injuries, communicable disease, emotional trauma, um, along with increases in uh, morbidity and mortality associated with chronic diseases. Um, damage to health facilities and water systems, food shortages, and increased population movements can also exacerbate these effects and negatively impact public health. While well, private, um, private water users also have to contend with all of these public health threats, they are also susceptible to specific long-term effects after a disaster. Um, firstly, as you all know, private water users are responsible for making sure that their water is safe to drink after a disaster, whereas a public system would be kind of routinely tested. Um, and drinking contaminated water, I mean, in the short term, that can mean gastrointestinal illness. In the long term, it can increase your risk for a range of other health effects, cancer, adverse birth outcomes, um, really depending on the type of contamination that's in the water. And those issues can have an impact on the family's financial well-being, which is likely already stretched uh, due to the disaster event. Programs for private water systems do vary across the country, but in most cases, public water systems are a bigger part of emergency planning in states and localities, and less resources are devoted to private water systems. And the populations relying on private water systems um, also vary, including urban and rural communities. Uh, however, there is a concentration of private water systems in rural areas and may have even less access to resources. Local health, local health agencies and rural communities are also typically smaller and may have less funding or ability to provide resources to private water users. And finally, education and awareness among private water users varies around the country, um, but many are really unaware of how to respond after a disaster occurs. They might not know the specifics of the system they're using or that they even rely on a private well or septic system. Okay, so private wells are really common. Um, over 44 million people, or one in nine Americans, rely on a private well as their primary source of drinking water. That's about 15% of the population um, that can be impacted by the issues that I outlined above after a disaster situation. 
And as you can see from this map on screen, private wells are present in every part of the country. This includes areas recently impacted by major disaster events like hurricanes and wildfires, kind of more on the coasts. Um, but it also includes areas in the middle part of the country that face other issues like really severe winter weather, um, drought, and earthquakes. So septic systems are just as common as private wells. 20% um, of US homes, or 26.1 million households, do rely on a septic system. And the use of septic systems in the US is not going away. 22% or 1.6 million of housing units less than four years old actually have a septic system. And coupled with just an increasing frequency of disaster events, um, the potential for damage to private water systems is only increasing. Um, this map is a little bit dated, um, but you can see that septic systems are also prevalent in all areas of the country. And then it kind of mirrors the map showing where private wells are located, since a lot of times homeowners will have both. And finally, um, about 50% of septic systems are located in rural areas, again, kind of highlighting the need for resources among rural communities. So what does the problem look like? So I think hurricanes are probably the disaster event that's uh, we've seen most in the news over the past few years. Um, potentially over 750,000 wells may have been affected by the 2016-2017 hurricane season. And that number is likely an underestimate as no data um, is included in that from Puerto Rico. Private wells, just kind of on a big picture level, might have issues like damaged components, like the well cap or casing, electrical issues, and major contamination, especially depending on the construction of the well. Um, floods, especially in rural areas, can carry pesticides, manure, um, and other local contaminants. And as I mentioned above, 20% uh, of U.S. households do rely on a septic system. Just for some context, 30% um, or 2.6 million people in Florida, hate step, a state heavily impacted by hurricanes, rely on a septic system. Um, after a hurricane or major flooding, um, septic systems can uh, issues can include a floating or dislodged septic tank, exposed sewage, and potential contamination of drinking water sources. Uh, one example of this that we heard about in Puerto Rico, actually, was some damaged septic systems um, in higher areas contaminating drinking water sources downstream for weeks after the hurricane. Okay, so wildfire is probably the other biggest area that we've heard about a lot. Um, the wildfires in California in 2017 destroyed nearly 1.2 million acres. Um, and we just heard a bit about this, so I'll be brief, um, but private wells can be impacted by wildfires in a number of ways, um, namely if any part of the wellhead or casing is damaged, um, that water could become contaminated. Um, one big fire we had here in Colorado, where Neha is located, the Black Forest Fire in uh, El Paso, Colorado in 2013, actually saw one third of the wells in that community damaged in some way. And I'll talk a little bit more about that fire in a second. Um, drought, though, can also be a major issue for private wells. Um, about one in 30 wells in western states went dry between 2013 and 2015. Uh, to a lesser extent, septic systems can also be damaged uh, by fire. Um, if heavy equipment, like a fire truck, is driven or parked over the drain field, or if above components are really severely burned, um, both problems could lead to potential contamination of a drinking water source and just general system malfunctioning. So I'm going to touch back on El Paso County that I mentioned earlier. Um, you can see it's a little bit south of Denver on that map there. Um, the Black Forest Fire referenced above caused really a lot of damage to private wells. One third were damaged in some way. Um, the biggest issue during this specific fire was a really high incidence of damaged wall caps. Um, and as was mentioned earlier, many of the older wells in this area, uh, many of them had plastic or PVC well piping. And that was damaged several inches down into the well. So a lot of people um, had some pretty severe damage. Um, traces of fire retardant was also found in some of the wells near firefighting activity months after the fire ended. I'm um, just kind of showing the need to, to test your water. Okay, so there are a few other issues that I'm going to go over briefly that private wells and septic systems can experience. 
um, including winter weather, power outages, and earthquakes. And that's certainly not an all-expansive list of the kind of disaster situations that private water users might uh, face. Um, but to get started, um, during winter weather, uh, people using private water systems you might encounter uh, many of the same problems as a, as a public system, like just simple frozen or burst pipes. On the other hand, specific issues like a frozen septic tank um, that could really impact how you're living during the winter um, are specific to private water users and will require professional assistance. And while power outages are not a disaster per se, uh, they do often occur during disaster situations. And even if not, uh, they are a common issue for private water users to deal with no matter uh, where they are in the country. And depending on the type of the system, uh, private wells and septic systems may not be able to function at all without power, which can lead to sanitation issues standing, stemming from a lack of water or waste disposal. And then earthquakes are quite common in some parts of the country and can in impact private water systems in a few ways. Uh, private wells might experience water level fluctuations and increase in the turbidity of the water and may become contaminated if the well casing or grouting is damaged. Similarly, uh, septic system components such as tanks and drain fields can become damaged and lead to drinking water contamination if the earthquake is severe. And I'm going to talk about earthquakes a little bit more. So I think for most of us, or at least for me, earthquakes aren't really high up on the list of disasters we think um, about occurring where we live, uh, but these events can really be quite common in some parts of the country. Uh, the picture on screen shows earthquakes and aftershocks, albeit fairly minor ones in this instance, in Alaska over just 17 days between the end of April and the beginning of May in 2018. And all these sorts of occurrences likely won't cause any major to major damage to private wells and septic systems. Private water users may still notice um, some small changes in their water. Alaska did have a more serious 7.9 magnitude earthquake in January 2018. And that state does usually get um, kind of a bigger earthquake like that every few years. And that could cause some more damage to private water systems, especially if the private well or the septic system is located near the epicenter of that earthquake. And then on another side of this, um, guidance for private water users during earthquakes, it's not as common as other disasters like hurricanes or, wild, or wildfires. It might be harder to find. Going off of that, I'm going to talk a little bit about the guidance that is available to private well users. So the guidance that's currently available really varies quite broadly. Um, in some states, especially those that experience frequent disasters, especially um, certain types of disasters, and they have really well-developed and updated guidance information available to well owners in that area. On the other hand, a lot of states and localities uh, don't really have any resources available. Um, and some of the information may be locally specific and not transferable to other states and localities. Another issue with some of the existing guidance information is keeping it updated. As I mentioned earlier, um, some states do a good job with this, while others might be providing well users with information that is over 20 years old and does not take new trends like emerging contaminants or new technologies into account. And then the technical level and available guidance uh, materials um, and the intended audience also varies. Uh, for instance, some um, septic system materials are kind of built for certified septic owners, which is a specific classification um, that only applies in some states, um, or doesn't provide any kind of educational context or resources for private water users, uh, which can be a big problem. Um, for instance, one question one of our partners gets a lot as a well contractor is, where is my wellhead? Um, which really shows the need uh, for some very basic guidance um, over technical, really technical information. Two areas of guidance that we've seen um, that I wanted to hit on that really vary a lot are well disinfection practices and, to a lesser extent, septic tank pumping procedures. So well disinfection guidance around the country uh, ranges quite widely. So some resources uh, provide well-developed uh, information, and it's based on evidence-based practices. Um, but others that we've seen um, online still recommending just kind of pouring bleach straight down the well. Um, guides also recommend using various types of disinfectants, times, procedures, 
um, and disinfecting a wall the wrong way or attempting to disinfect it when it's not even necessary can cause unnecessary damage to the well and to the water quality. Um, so we're trying to guide well owners to existing quality resources or to contact a professional. To a lesser extent, there is also some variation in guidance on when and if to have your septic tank pumped after certain disaster situations. Okay, so what are we doing about it? So NEHA is working on developing some resources focused on safety for homeowners in a variety of disaster situations, namely the ones I went over earlier in the presentation. And these resources are meant to point private water users to basic educational resources and provide guidance on preparing for and responding to these events. Above all else, the goal with these resources is to protect public health. They're meant to be kind of a one-stop shop for safety. Um, we don't want to advocate for private water users to attempt complicated repairs. Instead, we are advising when to call a professional and what steps to take to protect their private well and septic system and their families. Something that we've really learned, and I think that is pretty well known among those kind of creating resources um, around emergencies, clear communication is really essential uh, to helping well owners. If the advice is overly technical, it'll likely be ignored. Um, using everyday words, keeping the information concise is essential. A great way to ensure that that happens is to have someone well-versed in risk communication involved in creating materials or really any communications that are going to happen with well owners um, over the course of that disaster. So as I've said, some states, localities, and private organizations already have some strong resources, um, but they may be kind of regionally specific. Um, so the materials that we're working on are sort of meant to be a standard set of best practices for each disaster area. And the big thing, um, they're also meant to be a framework or a template that is flexible and can be adapted by agencies or organizations across the country. And I'll talk about that a little bit more um, on the next few slides. So a little bit more information about the ongoing work that we're doing. Um, this project uh, I've been referencing was started at the beginning of last year. Um, after drawing together some existing best practices, a committee made up of academia, industry partners, federal associations, nonprofits, and water professionals from state and local health departments reviewed some of these best practices and updated guidelines to create new materials, although this is still ongoing work. Um, and I want to uh, just point out for a sec, these partnerships have been really critical to our work here at NEHA. I think the most important lesson uh, when developing these resources um, is to get input from everyone involved, including those groups I just mentioned. Um, that makes the work more effective, and it utilizes existing expertise from across the spectrum. Make sure you don't leave anything out. So some guidance that we are including um, in these materials ranges from really basic information, like having a safe source of drinking water and the contact information for a licensed well contractor, a local health department, university extension, um, and or a water testing lab, kind of depending on where you are and uh, which of those agencies is the most involved. Um, on a more advanced note, um, if well and septic system users live in an area that is prone to a certain type of disaster, they might be able to take steps to protect their private water system well before a disaster occurs such as raising the well casing pipe above the regional floodplain, um, using fire resistant coverings, or installing insulated pipes in the case of really frequent freezing temperatures. We also have some important advice on precautions, including information on electrical hazards, being very aware of your surroundings before even attempting to inspect your system, um, and personal protective equipment. So the focus areas right now include the disaster areas that I mentioned above, um, although we are looking for other areas that need additional resources um, that may not be as common. Um, and besides sharing best practices, the committee is also really helping to uncover trends around the country, such as common types of septic systems in different regions um, that might determine how these guides are structured or how they will need to be modified um, depending on the location. And while the focus of this project is emergency preparedness, um, it's also an opportunity to kind of share educational resources that already exist for private wells and septic systems. I think being educated about their private water system is one of the best ways that 
private water users can be prepared for a disaster. So supporting those efforts um, that are already ongoing is important. Okay, and then lastly, I'll talk about some of the future uses and applications. So as I said, um, these guys are kind of meant to be a, a template um, that different organizations can take and do with what they will. Um, it could be expanded upon um, by local or state agencies. Local or state health departments could add their own branding, communication methods, uh, permitting codes, and regional advice uh, such as contamination risks. If there's something specific well owners should be testing for after an event, um, if it's more rural area, there might be livestock, agricultural, or oil and gas activities in the area. So it's really meant to be a resource for health departments that do not already have well-developed emergency preparedness programs for private water users. Um, we're also envisioning different formats, um, including online or in a printout version, as we do provide some information on people, or for people who live in disaster-prone areas um, and steps they could take far before a disaster occurs. Having that information available online as well um, could also be helpful. Um, and then once these resources are complete, uh, they can serve as a template to use for emerging challenges such as new disaster areas or disasters coming to areas that have not really experienced them pre previously. Uh, so in sum, these resources are meant to protect public health and provide basic safety guidance to private well and septic system users, um, containing kind of preparedness and education materials, in addition to some best practices for after a disaster occurs. All right, that's all I got for you. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. Your presentation did a really great job of kind of sharing the whole universe of issues here and aggregating some of what we've heard already and, and I think leading into Aubrey's presentation as well. Um, Allison, is there a projected timeline when these documents will be available? Yeah, so um, we kind of have two committees and we have a, a septic systems and a private wells. Um, the septic, septic system one, um, probably pretty soon, I would say um, late spring, early summer. Um, unfortunately, I know the private wells would be the maybe more um, interesting one to this audience, and that one's probably not looking uh, till next fall. Um, okay. We have some timeline issues with that one, but they're ongoing. Great, thank you. Let's see, that's all the questions we have at this moment, but if you do have additional questions for Allison, hopefully we can get to those at the very end. Um, for now, we will turn the presentation over to Aubrey. All right. Um, hi, all. My name is Aubrey Gilliland. I'm a research associate at LSU Health Sciences Center in New Orleans, Louisiana, and I'm here to talk to you all about opportunities to increase well user resilience after a natural disaster. Um, the the, what I'm going to go over today is based off a domestic well owner survey in the aftermath of catastrophic and historic flooding in areas surrounding Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Um, so the 2016 flooding event in Louisiana was uh, completely unprecedented, and there's no equal in the historical record. On Thursday, um, rain began to fall in and around Baton Rouge at a rate of two or more inches per hour. So this, um, this storm without a name ended on August 16th, and by that time, almost 7 trillion gallons of water had fallen on the state. Um, so areas received about half their annual average rainfall total within the span of those days, and this caused massive flooding throughout the region um, with at least 11 river gauges in southeast Louisiana, setting new record highs during this flooding event. So ultimately, um, FEMA de or the state declared um, 20 parishes were set designated as federal disaster areas. And so because so much rain fell in such a short little time, it had nowhere to go, and it completely flooded um, complete towns. And um, here's a neighborhood that was flooded. And because the water came up so quickly, people did not evacuate in time. So this led to the first deployment of the Cajun Navy, which is just a um, group, uh, all-volunteer group, who went out and were essentially rescuing people from their homes. This was, they rescued about 20,000 people, 
with um, 14, I mean, I'm sorry, 10,000 ended up in shelters and 146,000 homes ended up being flooded. This all culminated with about 10 to $15 billion in damage. So um, in addition to extensive damage to homes, private drinking water wells were submerged for days by several feet of flood water. This potentially exposed wells to contamination. And prior research um, shows that nationwide, well users don't prepare for these floods, obviously here there was a very little time, but um, in general situations they don't know how to um, properly seal their wellhead. And then after the flood water subside, they don't know how to treat their water and they just don't test it. So all of these factors culminate to leave users with dubious water quality after floods. So to improve upon this, we need to identify um, well user recovery behavior and essentially why they are not doing these um, recovery activities. And then also the resources needed to better respond to risks and misinformation associated with um, related well water hazards. So supported by an NSF rapid grant, a collaborative effort between Virginia Tech and LSU Health Sciences Center held a free well water testing event. Um, this was nine to 11 weeks after flood water subsided. This is because um, it was a very large region and flood water subsided differently every day. So um, kits were distributed over two days in two locations in Livingston Parish, which was an area designated for our study because um, it was a very high population reliant on domestic wells, as well as um, flooding was very high in prevalence there as well. And like most campaigns, especially one like this, um, we were reliant on our community networks to um, get the word out there. And so we have to thank First Baptist Church, St. Joseph Catholic Church, and the Livingston Parish Sheriff's Office. These groups were instrumental in getting this campaign off the ground and informing locals of this event. So um, the water kits, and they had sampling bottles, sampling instructions, as well as surveys. The surveys um, were meant to capture well water use both before and after the flood. Knowledge of well characteristics, such as um, if they knew their well depth or the year it was constructed, just to kind of see if they knew um, critical factors for well disinfection. And maintenance, if they were conducting well maintenance or treatment before and after the flood, as well as resource needs that they felt after the flood so as to um, best prepare for it. So um, 150 water kits were distributed and 112 were returned. This was a 75% response rate. Um, inclusion criteria was living in a home serviced by a private well and flooded from the August rain event. Six of those that were returned, six of the return surveys were excluded from analysis because they were blank or they were um, duplicates. A couple people have multiple properties that they wanted tested. And um, because people evacuated and um, from this flood, they were unsure of their flood impact, like if their um, wellhead was covered. So to um, verify their flood status, we compared the address that they gave us to USGS flood inundation maps, and we determined that 78 participants were flood impacted. So going into this um, study, investigators had a couple questions that they wanted to answer. Um, what knowledge gaps? may well users have? Do they not know how to test or do they just don't know that it's necessary to begin with? What is the risk perception of study participants? Did they realize that this was a potential contamination event and did they understand that consuming the water may be detrimental to their health? And what resource needs were in, are indicated in this well user population? Again, what do they need to properly recover from this Flood, and are there any maintenance barriers present in this group, such as do they feel that um, conducting maintenance would be too expensive or um, things similar to that? So in um, relaying these results, I'm going to kind of tailor it towards um, the three tiers of um, disaster response to try and, and what each group can do to promote well user resilience. Um, these tiers include individual, community. I know from the poll we did on Tuesday that there's a lot of community folks out there. Hopefully y'all can get maybe one or two things to further um, strengthen your emergency response. And the last one is government. So um, before the flood, 96% of our flooded participants 
were consuming their well water, but after this um, dropped down to 55%, this is a 43% reduction in um, well water consumption, but only 29% of our participants perceive their well water as safe to consume, and then 46% just were unsure of their water safety. Yet, with that, um, out of the 36 participants that said that they did not know if their water was safe to consume, only one tested their well water, 11 shot chlorinated, and then 19 or 53% continued drinking their water after the flood. And so we're just trying to figure out, if you did not know your water, your water was safe, why did you not test and why did you not, chlor why did you not shot chlorinate or make moves to um, conduct well maintenance? So looking at, um, this is a huge risk misperception. People were drinking the water without testing it um, when it may not be safe. So looking at testing, 94% did not test after the flood, and the majority um, indicated they just simply didn't know where to get their water tested. Um, yet with this, 62% resumed consuming their water post-floods. Um, this shows a lack of knowledge. People don't know where to get their water tested. And looking at maintenance or treatment, 66% did not um, maintain or treat their well water. And of those, the majority said that they did not know the necessity behind conducting well maintenance or treatment, and the, or that they didn't know how to do it. So again, 65% um, resumed consuming well water post flood among those who did not maintain or treat. And we're seeing, again, risk misperceptions and the lack of knowledge play at play here. Um, people didn't know that the water may be contaminated, and they didn't know how to disinfect their well. So, so as to facilitate well stewardship by overcoming well user risk perception and knowledge barriers, we did see a um, decrease in well use, but this is not found to be associated with testing or treatment. And even among those who doubted the safety of the water, they continued drinking it. So this suggests that risk perceptions and knowledge barriers have a stronger effect on well use because um, we just didn't see, they didn't understand that the well needed contaminated and those who did, they just didn't know how to go about um, removing the contamination. So this suggests that maybe addressing well user risk mis misperceptions and knowledge barriers may encourage solid stewardship. So how do we go about this? Um, usually this is done via community outreach in the aftermath of floods. So before the flood, we saw that 11% of our participants received information on potential flood impacts to their drinking water. They were told to, the majority were told to either test their water or to boil or not drink it, but none of this information was specific to domestic wells. This was just in general um, drinking water info. So we saw that there was um, essentially no communication before the flood. People were not receiving information about potential impacts to their well water. And after the flood, we're seeing a little bit of improvement. 25% um, learned of potential impacts to their drinking water. And of those, 8% learned of possible contamination and to treat their water. Um, so overall, there's just little communication within this disaster event, or th this population received little communication within, within this disaster event. And um, so of those who did, we just talked about how maybe addressing risk perceptions and overcoming knowledge barriers may help um, with well stewardship. So did this outreach that they received address those points? And we saw that um, they were told about possible contamination and to treat their water. So this is addressing risk perceptions. You know, it's, it's contaminated, you need to treat it, you're at risk. But it did not, but people were not informed as to how to go about these actions. So knowledge barriers seem to be still um, in play here. So to overcome communication challenges, um, a better characterization of the well population can help with this. So we asked our, uh, our study group, what was the best way to contact you both during and after the flood or just to receive information in general? And the majority said social media or the internet, but a lot also, but 35% said they were unsure or that they didn't know or that it was 
in, like impossible to reach them. Because you have to remember, there was no electricity, there was no internet, and um, there was a huge cell phone outage, actually, in particular, um, AT&T just had a huge blackout. So it's very difficult just in general to reach them. Um, and so when you do reach them, their main information needs were just information about testing, where the labs are, how to contact them, what contaminants to test for, and then water quality information. So, but talking about how difficult it is to contact these groups in general, um, to help this, you can expand upon existing communication constructs. Um, this includes utilizing your water well registry. You can identify, you can use this to identify areas with like a high prevalence of well, um, well users and then go in and characterize these groups. If your registry contains like mailing address or phone number, you can just send out a sampling campaign um, via mail or just call them up and ask them, what do you, one, how do you want to be co contacted during a disaster event? And what do you need? Like what will help you both, um, you know, recover as quickly as possible? And so this will allow you to tailor your outreach mode to your target population. Some people, this well users are a very diverse group. There's elderly, there's also more urban groups, and not everyone is as technologically savvy. Some people still prefer um, mail as their um, point of contact. So you really have to understand your target population. It's gonna be different for each area, for um, between communities, and so really tailoring your outreach mode can um, help overcome these communication challenges. So um, here in Louisiana, we tried to use the contact information available on the well water registry, but um, we saw that there was no information, essentially. We did not have um, physical address or uh, mailing address or phone number, and but many other states do have this information and it is published um, on their usually health department website. So that would be greatly helpful because this could be utilized by groups to reach well owners in real time during disasters. And one last little suggestion is um, local knowledge brokers can be utilized. These are individuals within the community who have been trained and certified in um, well protection and disinfection protocols, and they can be utilized by uh, well owners who want, who don't know how to maintain their well, and they can just go to their neighbor, who is a local knowledge broker, and ask them, how do I go about this? So that can be a really easy, not easy, but like a really accessible way to contact them. Yet, these not local knowledge brokers themselves may evacuate, and so once again, just communication and reaching these people is very difficult. So it's very difficult, therefore, after the event, it's, it's essentially too late to try and uh, get these people to fix their wells and ensure their drinking water. So that's why preparation is essential. These things need to be told to them before so that going into the flood, they know how to, one, protect their well, seal that wellhead, and then when they come back, make sure that their water is safe to consume. So uh, flood insurance is the most pre important preparation homeowners can take in protecting themselves before floods. This is the um, flood risk and resulting flood insurance maps called FIRMS are set by FEMA. So this is the firm for the parishes included within our study. Zone X, I'm oh, no, sorry, the light blue or is indicated by, sorry, the light blue means zone X, which is low risk, and the darker blue and the navy indicate zones A and V, E, which are high risk, those are designated by FEMA as special flood hazard areas, and those are um, at high risk for flooding and are required to purchase flood insurance um, to receive lending for their home. And here's an overlay of the August 2016 flood inundation. As you can see, um, I'm gonna kind of go back and forth there. You can kind of see that um, the light blue areas or zone X were still flooded. So um, it seems that this flood, that these um, firms were not accurate predictors of flood risk. So looking at our participants, 27% of those in zone X or the low flood risk flooded 
and 14% of those in zones A or AE, which were high flood risk, did not flood. And now we're going to look at Livingston Parish, which again was the parish that was um, most inundated by floodwaters with 87% of residents located within flooded areas, but only 22% of their residents were required to have flood insurance. So these are pretty large discrepancies between actual flooding and designated flood risk. And so we're looking, so climate change findings indicate these rain events similar to the one that happened in August may occur more frequently than previously expected. Looking at this infographic on the left side, this is um, reviewing the average number of years between events. Today we only have maybe 30 years between events as compared to 19, in the 1900s where they had 50 years between events. And this is actually particularly interesting because the same area that was flooded um, in August 2016 experienced a similar but less catastrophic flood in March of 2016. It flooded the same, almost the same areas. It was also pretty bad. But so these people only got about five months in between events. So all in all, this is just saying that there's a 40% increase in the odds of similar events as this flood. And on the right side, we're going to look at um, how today we have more uh, increase in the typical three-day heavy rain total in inches as compared to 1900. And this just is saying that there's a 10% increase in the intensity and the amount of rain that we will be seeing in these events. So you would think this may, with the climate change findings and then with um, we're seeing that lower stones flooded, maybe this would call for a re-examination of flood risk, but uh, FEMA did not do this. They said this event was too rare to merit investigation. So since this isn't done and because completely changing um, flood zones can be detrimental to homeowners, they have to now rec like purchase flood insurance, which they haven't been doing you know, since they lived in this house. So maybe we can adapt these firms or flood insurance rate maps to enhance resident preparedness, like add in a component for climate change findings. Maybe this can be like a other group, not the federal government, but it will help residents and communities better prepare themselves for the flood because they understand I'm at higher risk now. This is also pretty interesting. Uh, the Technical Mapping Advisory Council, which is a panel of experts tapped by FEMA to look at current climatology um, projections that, that include climate change and to um, make recommendations to FEMA on flood risk and the resulting insurance maps. But under the current White House administration, 16 of the 20 council members are waiting for appointment clearances and have yet to submit the 2018 report. So FEMA still is waiting on that 2018 report. So therefore, um, government inaction or even their inability to act may be leaving thousands of homes and residents, not only in Louisiana, but across the country, underprepared and unaware of their flood risk. So this is just our general conclusions and recommendations. First, we saw that well users have misperceptions about well water quality post-flood. So to combat this, motivational information is needed on flood-related waterborne health hazards. This includes in, uh, informing them of events that may introduce contaminants to domestic floods. This includes floods, hurricanes, earthquakes, tornadoes, et cetera. So these well users understand, oh, this event happened. I need to not drink my well water and ensure safety of it. Um, and then also the health effects of consuming these contaminants. If they leave their well water untreated. Um, secondly, we saw that um, a lack of knowledge on well testing and treatment acts as a barrier to stewardship. So to combat this, information is needed on well testing labs and contaminant specific treatment approaches. So these tests of these, um, a list of testing labs can be um, available online and updated frequently to include all of the um, information, address, phone number, links to websites. We looked at the one it, for the uh, Louisiana Department of Health, and it was lacking some phone numbers, and not all of them, when, they, when we called them, not all of them were able to test well water to begin with. 
Also, we should include list some contaminants to test for and specific treatment approaches when those tests come back and they're like, oh, you're positive for you know, E. coli, this is a proper procedure for disinfecting your well and ensuring that your water is safe to consume. Next, we're seeing that outreach did not reach, outreach did not reach most residents. So we should develop community-specific best practices to improve education and communication. Again, this is utilizing your well water registry, characterizing your audience, tailoring outreach channels and modes, and then also you could use knowledge, local knowledge brokers to spearhead well recovery. And oops, sorry. And again, um, flood risk zone was not a accurate predictor of flooding in the August 2016 event, and we could maybe adapt flood risk maps to aid in preparedness. So these are our overall lessons learned. We saw that communication networks need to be established prior to the next flood. Um, when the flood happens, it's too late. These um, individuals need information immediately, and they're going to be hard to reach, as I talked about earlier. They are also inaccessible. Again, the roads are flooded. They are covered with mud when the, floods when the flood recedes. Um, it's very difficult to go out there, and not everyone can reach a well specialist in that time. So it's better to prepare and have that information handy before the event happens. State well water registries can be a very useful tool if contact information is published. Again, groups can use this information and contact these well users in real time. And then routine resident training and emergency response planning by community and state officials targeting well owners should be necessary because, again, they need to understand their risks and overcome these knowledge barriers so as to really enhance and promote well resilience, well user resilience after floods. So we like to acknowledge the um, our supporters, the NSF and the USDA, as well as our well water registry experts at the Louisiana Department of Natural Resources, as well as our um, the folks who helps with the sampling and outreach event. So thank you all very much. I really appreciate you um, allowing me to speak today. Again, my name is Aubrey Gilliland, and um, you can email me if you have any more questions. Also, we have a paper coming out that highlights some of the results that were included in this um, presentation. So if you'd like to see what the whole study, the results from that um, are, you can go ahead and check that out when it comes out. Thank you. Thank you, Aubrey. A couple of questions here specifically for you, and then we'll move on to our panel discussion. Um, in your sampling event, what contaminants were tested for? Was it just bacteria, total coliform, or E. coli, or were there other contaminants as well? Uh, not, um, just not, not just microbial. It was also like Legionella, and um, I'm sorry, there were some other things that they tested for. That would be the dye at all paper coming out. It's uh, DT mostly handled that work, and I wasn't a part of that, but. Okay. Yeah, definitely not just microbial. Thank you. Um, many states struggle with knowing where all of their wells are. How complete is your mm -hmm. Louisiana well water registry, and what do you recommend we do to identify more of these wells? Um, so speaking to the LDNR, the Louisiana Department of Natural Resources, who kind of um, oversees our well registry, they say it may be incomplete because I guess people, it, we, it was not required to register your well until 1974, I believe. Okay. So all of those before that are not registered. And so as to combat that, maybe you can um, add, I know some states add a um, requirement to um, test your well, you know, with the transfer of real estate. So okay. maybe you could also add a component. You got to register your well as well, again, also. So yeah. Well, maybe if we have some other folks who want to share their experience with that in the in the question box, we can um, share what other states do as well. In the meantime, though, could you yeah. give us some additional examples of who you consider to be knowledge brokers? You know, on Tuesday, Drew explained the value of the Texas Well Owner Network, and are you mostly including mm -hmm. these these uh, savvy well owners, or are you also including other professionals in this category? Um, in smaller communities, it would probably be more savvy well owners. But um, there are a few um, groups 
here in Louisiana that really cater to the well owner and have events and educational um, trainings. And so they can definitely act as um, knowledge brokers as well. OK, thank you. Um, a couple questions here um, moving to the full panel. So any of you are free to answer, even those who uh, spoke on Tuesday as well, if you're able to join us. The first question is, is what partnerships really made your work more effective? And even thinking about the partnerships that you want to continue growing and building into the future so that you continue doing well with this work. I'm not going to call anyone, so whoever <laughs> speaks first. Um, so our state partnerships, I don't know if they wanted to say anything, but our state partnerships um, would have made work more effective. But for some reason, we had a lot of difficulty getting in contact with them. So we, it was a little disappointing and had a lot of recommendations just for to help them. But also our partnerships with the community, local community, again, the churches, the sheriff's um, office who really helped, uh, you know, essentially tell these well owners, hey, we're doing this event, come get your water tested. And so really your community network is um, very important in this. Well, that makes a really strong point that it may not always be the organizations that you would think of. You know, law enforcement would be one, but right. maybe churches wouldn't be. But it's another kind of trusted organization within a community where people are going to listen to their recommendations. Totally. Especially in these rural communities, um, a lot of people go to church. A lot of people have, like, they're really good friends. The neighbors are pretty strong um, networks. So, yeah, you can really utilize them. Great. Anybody else want to chime in on this one? Well, as far as in Lake County, since all the fires that we've had here out in California, in, in Lake County we have 89 public water systems. And it used to be there were many water managers that had no idea who the staff even was at the neighboring water system. And now we all know each other. Um, and, and, and the second one I would think of is, is I tried to develop a relationship when I first started here in Middletown six years ago with the local fire chief and uh, it didn't go anywhere. We now have each other's phone numbers and uh, we, we keep in regular contact. Um, so th those are my two. Great. And this is Allison. I mean, NEHA doesn't, is a little different. We're more of kind of big picture supporting the organizations that help uh, well owners. But I think from our members who work at say state or local health departments, um, the biggest partner that they always identify is university extensions in some capacity, whether that's, mm -hmm. and I know that we've already talked about this quite a bit yes, um, on Tuesday, but I, I guess I just wanted to stress it again. Um, in states that maybe don't have as big of a relationship between a uh, state health department or a state agency and a university extension, um, there's some really innovative partnership, especially after um, disaster situations. Well, I think the point from Tuesday that was really most relevant here is that that is another trusted organization that doesn't have that government hat that may not always uh, receive the same response. <laughs> yeah, that's true. All right, any other thoughts here? In our, our last conference in 2017, partnerships were a huge theme, and I know this is, will continue to come out because none of us can do the work that we do um, without others who are all vying for the, the same direction. We've got some examples here of neighborhood associations and coalitions, realtor associations, or other some suggested examples. All right, thank you. Now, you guys can continue submitting your questions for a few more minutes here. We did get another comment about the uh, well registry. We know this is a huge problem. Um, in Missouri, they're reporting that their registration is only for wells drilled after 1987, which was the start of their law, um, and they uh, and they cannot receive wells from before, and their, data, their database is not required to update owner information upon property transfer, so most of it is outdated. Mm -hmm. In New York, the law was passed in 2000. Um, I'm receiving a comment here uh, on Mississippi. <laughs> Any well under six inches doesn't need to be uh, recorded into their database. So with such a wide variety of requirements uh, for doing this, it makes it harder to to reach those well owners and to make sure that you're understanding that you're, you're serving them in the, the right capacity. Um, we have another question for the whole panel here. 
Um, with all the barriers that we've discussed, including the lack of, lack of regulations, not only for well construction, but of course the huge lack of regulation for, for what that water contains, and the lack of well owner knowledge, how do we tackle this problem? Where do we start? Um, and then with that lens of, of natural disasters and emergency response events, what's, what do you feel like is the low-hanging fruit or, or one project that we as a community professional should really be focusing on? This is Allison. I guess I'll take a stab at that. Um, I think the, the biggest low-hanging fruit um, and I don't know if this is even low hanging, but it's taking the, the case studies and the examples that we've heard over the last few days about ways to set up some kind of testing services after a disaster. I think that's one of the really critical things that need to be focused on for well owners in particular um, first thing after a disaster is over. Um, so whether that's, um, I don't know, putting out guidance through social media or, or providing test kits or using any one of those methods, I think is probably the first thing, um, but it's definitely a lot to tackle um, within that question I'd agree with. <laughs> well, and oftentimes, it, while it seems so large and we know there's barriers that it's some of the, it's actually really simple information. You know, some of the things that John mentioned today with, with insurance and making claims and then also how do you find out if your water's safe, those are two relatively simple things. It may take time and effort, but it's the legwork. It's not, it's not necessarily difficult. Um, or even difficult to understand. So hopefully that, you know, the communication can be simpler than it would be on, on other things. Um, we have another question here, kind of going in a different direction, similar to what we talked about before, but what do you recommend to test for in addition to the, the bacteriological constituents after a disaster. And, and I see that, that Kimberly Phillips from Tuesday is on here as well, and she might have a, um, a broader idea, because I know there were a lot of issues, particularly um, in Houston, with contaminated sites, um, both in terms of contaminated floodwaters and contaminating the wells afterwards of, you know, Hi, I, sites and types of things. Hi, Jennifer. I am here, actually. Great. Um, um, that's a question that we get all the time, all the time. And we, unfortunately, are very restricted in what we can recommend to have done. Okay. Um, in the, the area that we're in, um, being so urban and so low um, sea level-wise, our elevation is so low, um, wells are contaminated so easily. Mm -hmm. And what... My stock answer, because we get this question all the time, is for, you know, I ask, is there something in particular that you are worried about? Like if they, they, they think there's runoff from a business or um, anything that they think it might be around running off into their well, because we can't, we can't recommend, okay? The one thing that I do I sent them to the EPA's page for all of the contaminants that drinking water is regulated for. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, um, if they go to a private well, we only test for lead and um, bacteria here at our lab but and for drinking water. But if they go to a private lab and ask for that whole panel, it's enormously expensive. So Correct. unfortunately, it's, it's, we're caught kind of between a rock and a hard place because we don't say, look, you need to test your well for everything that um, public drinking water is tested for. At the same time, if they have some specific concern, of course, you want to try to lead them in the right direction. But we, being a government agency, we're restricted about recommending another laboratory, a private laboratory. So unfortunately, we say find a laboratory, um, Call them up and ask them if they test what you're test for what you're looking for. Um, it's just it's really hard. It's it's a bad position for us. Well, obviously you're in the same position even after a treatment result, whether you're a public or a private lab. Uh, often you, you you can't recommend what to do. 
um, right. can provide, here's the type of thing that you would need to treat for, but we are often as professionals in positions where we can't recommend a company or um, even a brand. And the other, I'm sorry, the other thing that we do, we're TNS certified or accredited, and we also um, send people to that list, and I, I'm very adamant about that, to only use accredited laboratories mm -hmm. um, to get their results from, because labs pop up around here all the time. And um, especially after a disaster or whatever. So you want to make sure that they're getting, um, you know, reliable results if they do decide to go, um, you know, outside of us to get, to get some tests run. And then they're going to come right back to us and say, what does this mean? Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> yeah. so the, the EPA in our state, um, agencies also have really great um, resources for that, for, for people to look and see what drinking water is actually tested for. Unfortunately, the levels are so, so low, which is what makes the test so expensive. Yes. All right. Uh, related hey, question. Jennifer. Here. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. Who's, who's this? Uh, this is this is Kelsey Piper. Right. Um, one thing, uh, uh, Wake County, North Carolina, does something really creative. They actually, for recommending testing, they have like a first timers package, and they name their packages to help people pick out what they should be testing for. And I just think it's a really cool idea that they've done, and they found it's really easy to work with homeowners because they've used like, you know, common jargon to say, hey, oh, you haven't done this well get our first timers package. So that was a really interesting thing that they've done. That's that's really okay, neat. What yeah, else did y'all test for? I know y'all looked at Legionnaire's disease and found that that was at a higher prevalence than total coliform in E. coli. Oh, so in the Louisiana study, um, we looked at Legionella, Negleria, Phalari, um, total bacteria in the water, uh, total coliform E. coli, and then we did inorganics, looking at like metals, like lead, copper, iron, arsenic, things like that. Great. Thanks for did you have a level? I'm, I'm sorry. Did you have a level that you were shooting for on the total bacteria? I do is not know off the top of my head. If you'd like to uh, reach out, um, Dr. Dong Juan Jay is running that study and found some really cool results. Yeah, that can get that can get really touchy because there's you know people want zero bacteria, so that we've never we've never gone that route of total bacteria ever. Well, that's more of a I think that's more of a research method because it's more looking at DNA. Um, but if anyone has questions, um, I'd be happy to give Dong Juan's email out because uh, I know she'd be happy more than happy to tell people about the opportunistic pathogens that she was looking in flooded wells after the Louisiana flooding. So, well, that um, is, that, oh, go ahead. Um, this is Steve. I'd like to make a comment about total bacteria. Um, bacteria are ubiquitous in groundwater. Um, there's methanogenic bacteria, iron reducing bacteria, sulfate reducing bacteria. Um, you can't get a zero bacteria count from a groundwater well. Um, it's right. the that, that bacteria was that are harmful right. that we should be worried about. Yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of other bacteria that I personally think ought to be regulated, um, especially down here. But unfortunately, we're restricted to the things that are regulated that we can report. So um, until the EPA expands that list, it's it it's kind of dangerous waters for anybody to start measuring that and reporting that. Well, what's ironic about hey, that? Um, what's ironic about that is there are no requirements for private wells. Those are all public well, uh, public water requirements. <clears throat> well, I think it just points to but that, but the risk communication are, issue. With... Treat it, though. I'm just saying that uh, all the regulations are for public wells, not for private wells. Right. Right, but those are, that's for treated water, so it's com just so completely different. So related to the well testing here, we have a follow-up question on where what are the different funding sources for 
private well testing after an event, whether that's for an, a group or an entity or for individuals. Um, I think we've got a bunch of different funding sources that, that our panelists can share. So this is Kelsey again. Um, the groups that we worked with, um, we were funded by the National Science Foundation, NSF, the USDA, and FEMA, um, as well as uh, Texas AgriLife Extension. Okay. Well, I think one of the, the, the present, I think it was Drew's presentation, but one of the presentations on Tuesday was talking about how important it is to, Oh, you know, actually it was Kimberly's presentation, to get that funding source in place before the event and know that it's just part of your preparation plans of how are the laboratories going to get paid. So uh, that I'm sorry, Jennifer. That, that, that was me also. I apologize. I'm not completely catching all these questions. Um, oh, no, yeah, that's no, a key no apologies thing. needed. I was just sharing an, ex yes. an example. So. Yeah, that the funding is is a huge deal, and it's one of those things that really, really needs to be done ahead of time. You know, along with the phone trees and the you know establishing the communication, like we've been talking about, and everybody seems to be hitting that point, and we're we seem to all really be in agreement about that. Uh, all right, so we have another question for the panel. I think this might be our last one here. Um, where are the registered sanitarians at the local health departments? And, and I think the question might be like, where do they sit within the organizations? Because not, you know, we in, in, in preparing for our conference, we're looking at the organization of, of health departments in Pennsylvania, and we see that, you know, some of them have environmental health programs, and many of them do not. So it's it, it really varies even within a single state. Um, and this commenter says that we're an undervalued and overlooked profession. Um, uh, Perhaps Allison may have a, a comment here from the NEHA perspective of of how of what NEHA is doing to you know promote uh, this particular profession or this professional's role. Yeah, I mean, I would definitely agree with that comment that the undervalued and overlooked profession. I mean, environmental health professionals are um, kind of one of the biggest kind of concentrations of workforce within health departments, um, but they're really um, under-recognized. So I definitely understand where you're coming from, and that's one of our goals at NEHA as an organization is to promote um, just awareness around environmental health professionals and registered sanitarians. Um, so definitely understand that second part. Um, going back to the first part where registered sanitarians are located at local health departments, I think um, like you said, Jennifer, it really varies. Um, in some states, if the health department is maybe the, I don't know, the entity that is responding to the uh, disaster event, registered sanitarians may very well be on the front lines if they're really involved in environmental health and private wells and septic systems. Um, and in other places, that may not be the case. Um, so I think it kind of varies. Um, and I don't know if that's a Kind of, it's a, it's a hard to pin down. Um, there's, there's a lot of variance in health departments across the country. Sure. Um, well, yeah. as a, I've been an undervalued health department employee for 31 years, so um, I can kind of address this. It's um, it's hard. It's it's a hard thing to stick with, and we're supposed to be here when someone needs us, but. Um, the rest of the time they don't think about us. And the other part of that issue is when people think about the health department, they think about the clinical, the medical part mm -hmm. of the health department way more than the environmental part of the health department. So some people don't even know there is an environmental section. Um, health true. department just means immunizations, clinics, you know, that kind of thing, and not um, environmental. So that's that's part of what we're not out there, you know, front and center doing school immunizations or anything. We're just along the side of the road taking samples. So it's, it's hard to get any exposure. So when we started the private well class, um, one of the things we noticed right away is that a lot of sanitarians were taking our class. And what we learned from talking to those folks, 20% uh, probably were actually registered sanitarians. <clears throat> is that there just isn't a lot of training out there as a sanitarian when you get your degree or, you know, your certificate or whatever um, related to private well issues. So it's not just, I mean, it is 
also the environmental health side, but it's even more so for the private well arena in that there just isn't a lot of, um, there hasn't been until recently a lot of information out there available. We had a, a ton of people say, why wasn't this here when I started my job? Because I really could have learned something. Well, and I think one of the things that we've tried to do with our program, because we do have our wateroperator.org program um, as a sister program to private well class, is that we're trying to encourage these two communities of water professionals and environmental professionals to communicate and lean on each other. Um, here in Illinois, they're actually at two different agencies, but in many agencies, they are they do sit together. And we know our, our friends at RCAP are wearing multiple hats these days with doing both private drinking water as well as public. And leveraging this knowledge um, from these different communities can help us tackle some of the problems. We saw that. Um, with, or, and we are seeing that with some risk communication issues with uh, PFAS contaminants, whether it's in public or private wells, uh, that the the health community is, is helping educate the public drinking water folks on how do you talk about things when they aren't actually regulated um, and to, you know, make those communications effective with the public. So I think there's, there's still a lot to improve in that regard, but that is one way that we can and, you know, increase the exposure uh, of the sanitarian profession and environmental health professionals. I think that is all the questions we have. I want to thank you all for participating in our very first uh, two-day colloquium event. Um, this seemed to go really well, so I imagine we might do something similar in the future. And of course, if you would uh, love to spend time talking about these types of issues and private well issues with us, we'd love to see you in Harrisburg in May. But with that, I will thank all of our presenters for joining us and wish you all a great weekend.